Hi, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're doing well. Sorry for the lack of videos this past few weeks. I've just been really busy uh, this summer. I know I mentioned earlier this year that I'm going to try and work out a sustainable frequency for me to upload. I guess I'm still working it out. Uh, hopefully I'll figure it out sooner rather than later. But yeah, this week's video is a bit basic in that I wanted to have a video on my channel that talks about different metering types and techniques that I've learned this past couple of years in the hopes that it'll be useful for someone that's either starting out film photography or a beginner photographer that, you know, are not so familiar with the different metering types and want to learn more. So what is metering? The act of measuring light in any given scene with a reference ISO that determines the right shutter speed and aperture to properly expose for an image. Keyword here is properly, and that word is subjective. Once you've learned and understood the basics of metering, you can do whatever the hell you want. There have been quite a few techniques developed over the years in this space, and a lot of them are here to stay, so let's go do some metering. This is a quick and easy way to meter and probably the most fun way to meter in my opinion, specifically when shooting film. F16 is our beginning aperture, hence sunny 16 and whatever the ISO of your film, that'll be our reference uh, ISO, which would in turn be used as a shutter speed. So for instance, if you're shooting with the ISO 100 film, then your shutter speed is probably 100th of a second. And if your camera doesn't support it, they usually do 1 25th of a second. So, you know, that could be your reference shutter speed. So F16 and the shutter speed, which is kind of the inverse of your ISO, is where we're going to begin. And using that, there are four or five different conditions that you'd have to remember. Go ahead and pause the video to take a screenshot or get your notepad out to, you know, write them down, but these are the conditions to remember. You can also find this information in film spec sheets. So depending on what film you're shooting, just, you know, go on Google and look for their spec sheet and you should find this information on there as well. So as you can see, we started with the F16 aperture and then as we moved down each condition, we opened up the aperture by one stop, letting in, you know, one stop of more light. You can obviously play with it. You know, you don't have to use the same aperture and shutter speed for the conditions. You can play with aperture and the shutter speed as long as the relationship between them remain the same. What do I mean by that? Let's say it's a day like today where it's sunny, but a little bit hazy. And according to the F16 rule, it should be shot at F8 and 1 25th of a second. Uh, but you want to shoot this at F5.6, uh, whatever the reason is. That's absolutely fine. So F5.6 is just one stop away from F8. You're giving one extra stop of light. So when you set the aperture to F5.6, all you have to do is change your shutter speed from 1 25th of a second to 2 50th. So the extra stop of light that you gave by opening up the aperture by one stop, you're taking that away uh, to balance it out by cutting down the shutter speed or making it faster by one stop. Simple as that. In terms of advantages, you don't need to carry around a light meter. Um, and I think it's really fun, you know, especially when you're walking around and documenting life or street photography. Sometimes you don't have the time to get your meter out and take a reading and then take a photo. Sometimes the moment is just gone. So in situations like that, you know, when you're familiar with the Sunny 16 rule, you probably already have your camera set to the right shutter speed and aperture and you, you can just snap away. So yeah, I think those are big positives for Sunny 16. In terms of disadvantages, this is all based on what the sunlight is outside. Uh, so you can't necessarily use it in artificial lighting conditions. Um, and also you can't use this rule when there's no sunlight. 
So, you know, you're probably going to have to rely on a light meter for that. This is probably the most common way in which many of us meter because all the cameras like digital film or even your phones, all the cameras that have inbuilt light meters, they're all reflective light meters. Um, so what is a reflective light meter? As the name suggests, it measures the light that is reflected off of your subject or your scene. One thing to note is that all reflective meters have a reference point of 18% gray. So a reflective meter is trying to work out the shutter speed and aperture that you need to use to get a certain spot to be exposed as an 18% gray. You might have seen some examples of a white plate with fruit metered using reflective meters to illustrate this example. Uh, let me show you a quick DIY example here. We have a white card. If I use my digital meter to measure the correct exposure, my white card looks gray, right? But if I put a gray card next to my white card and take a spot reading off of that gray card, we can see our white card is perfectly white. This doesn't necessarily mean that um, you can't get accurate readings off of a reflective meter. It's just something you have to be aware of so that when you're out and about taking readings off of that meter, especially for subjects that have bright white or really dark black areas in them, just something to keep in your mind. What I do normally is that if I'm taking a photo outside, you know, a landscape or whatever, I try to look for a spot that looks like 18% gray to me. And I take a spot reading off of that. And usually that gives a more accurate representation of the colors in the image. There are a few different types of reflective meters out there. The most common types are spot, center weighted and matrix or evaluative metering. The first two are pretty self-explanatory. A spot meter essentially measures the light from a specific spot in a scene. Usually it's the center of the frame. A center weighted or an average reflective meter measures the light from a slightly bigger part in the center of the frame. Uh, and then your matrix or evaluative is a little bit advanced in that the frame is split into multiple different areas and then readings are taken off of those different areas and an average of those readings is used to find a proper exposure or in some cases um, the area that is in focus is given more weightage in terms of exposing. Um, there are some cameras that work out what kind of scene you're trying to photograph and you know make adjustments accordingly if your camera has a matrix or evaluative metering it's probably best to leave it at that uh, you know for 99 percent of the time because more often than not you're gonna get a proper exposure using that setting what are the pros uh, because reflective meters are easily available and pretty much all cameras have them in built you don't need to carry an external meter whether it's incident or you know uh, something like a pentax spot meter you don't need to carry it it's already in your camera just know the limitations and work with it basically uh, the disadvantage would have to be the fact that i wouldn't call it a disadvantage necessarily the quirk is that it's trying to resolve everything to middle gray which means if you're photographing something that's you know bright white or really dark just have to understand this specific limitation of reflective meters and then you're good incident metering is when you're measuring the light that is hitting your subject so you're not waiting for the light to be reflected off of your subject you're literally taking your meter getting close to your subject and taking a measurement of the light that is hitting your subject whether it's natural light or studio light this usually means that you're gonna get a better color representation of your subject because your meter is not trying to resolve anything to 18 percent gray it's simply saying hey this is the amount of light that is hitting this area 
and use this f-stop and this shutter speed. A common incident light meter would look like this. Um, this white bulb here is just a diffuser dome. The cell that captures the light is right here. There's usually a button you press which records the light and displays what your f-stop and shutter speed should be. You can vary the f-stop or the shutter speed after taking the measurement and it'll show you the corresponding value of the other point. Uh, advantages are that you get an accurate representation of colors or skin tones because you're just measuring the light that's hitting your subject. In terms of disadvantages, it is an additional thing you need to carry. Um, it's not an inbuilt meter in a camera. You would have to take it uh, separately and it's probably not the best one to use for landscapes or subjects that are further away from you that you can't necessarily reach to measure the light that's hitting them. If you stuck around for this long, uh, this is one of my favorite ways to meter because it gives a lot of control uh, and it forces you to think about how you want your image to look like. So what is zone system? This is a technique developed to accurately evaluate the exposure values of a scene so that we're able to capture and print textural ranges important to us in an image. A zone system has 10 zones starting from zone 0 to zone 10. In printing terms, the part of the image that's in zone 0 represents pure black and zone 10 pure white. Zone 1 and zone 9 are the zones when we start to have some useful information. Zone 2 and 8 is when we start to have more textural information. And zone 3 and zone 7 are the areas where we have more distinguishable textural detail. And zone 5 is the middle of the spectrum, which also represents the middle gray 18% value. I use a Pentax digital spot meter when I'm using a zone system. I set my ISO using this dial. Then all I have to do is point it at my scene and take different readings of different spots. Um, this is a one degree spot meter, by the way and it gives me the EV value of different spots. Then I think about in, the, in terms of darker areas in the image, what part of the image do I want to retain distinguishable detail in? Then I usually place that in zone three, and then I double check that my zone seven or zone eight you know, contains the um, areas of the image that I want to retain some information in the highlights as well. The good thing is that you are making that choice as you're taking a photo and you're not letting your camera to decide automatically what it can clip, you know, either in highlights or shadows. I guess the advantages uh, of zone system is that it gives a lot more control and it forces you to imagine the final image. In terms of disadvantages, it is a new kind of technique to learn. I mean, reflective metering and incident metering are quite intuitive in that it's just one step process. But with zone system, you have to learn a little bit more to make use of the benefits and you will have to carry a separate meter and Pentax spot meters are not cheap. I think you can also get Minolta meters, but they, their prices are increasing as well. So I would say these meters are expensive. Pretty much it. Um, for zone system and for this week's video. If you stayed for this long, I truly appreciate you giving me your time. I really hope there is some information in here that you found useful. If you didn't get any of that, no problem. Let me know in the comments or DM me on Instagram. I would be more than happy to have a private chat. If I got any of that wrong, also please let me know in the comments. Thank you once again. Take care. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.